um, muted my um, audio by then with a few slides on. Um, I cannot get this thing to work the way I want it to. Um, with a few slides on future challenges. I really cannot get this thing to move. There we go. Sorry, Barbara. If, yeah, if you go to the bottom left hand corner, you'll see two arrows. That should be that should do. Oh, it. got it. Okay. Okay. Got it. Okay. So as most of you certainly know, the concept of dependency originated in Latin America in the late 1960s, and it came in two versions. One was a quite mechanical one which implied that external actors prevented development from occurring in Latin America, epitomized by Andre Gunder Frank's phrase, the development of underdevelopment. But of course, there was also a more sophisticated version of dependency theory, um, which said that yes, external actors are important, but the key thing is to understand the relationship between external and internal actors in hindering or distorting development. And here the reference is to Fernando Enrique Cardoso um, and to a lesser extent his work with Enzo Faletto when they talked about dependent development, a what I would call a distorted type of development. The definition of dependency according to the second version um, is, I can only see part of this screen, so I have to read it off of mine. Um, economically, a country is dependent when the accumulation and expansion of capital cannot find its external dynamic within the system. So to escape dependency, according to this analysis, Latin American countries had to begin to produce at home technology, capital goods, and finance rather than importing them from abroad. The dependency concept spread successfully to Africa and to South Asia, even to Eastern Europe, but it seemed to run into a brick wall when it came to East Asia partly because the East Asian case seemed to contradict dependency hypotheses, dependency basically disappeared from both academic and policy discussions by the 1990s. But in addition to the East Asian experience, there was another major argument that dependency was too fuzzy that it lacked mechanisms to try and explain how dependency would link to development or lack thereof. So what I tried to do in this book and actually um, many years before was to try to remedy this lack of mechanisms by focusing on three of them, markets, leverage, and linkage. So markets and the way I look at things, um, especially trade and finance form the context in which development takes place or doesn't by providing resources or not, depending on cycles. Uh, markets are manipulated in a variety of ways, um, but it's quite different from what I consider leverage, where a country specifically tries to make a dominated one um, go along with what it wants to do by the use of political or economic power. Linkage is a much more um, subtle kind of relationship. Um, ideas, education, employment lead to dominated countries identifying with the interests of a dominant country and therefore wanting to do what the dominant country wants. Let me emphasize that these three mechanisms are not mutually exclusive, but are interconnected in a variety of ways. The dependency argument originated to explain lack of development in Latin America under US domination in the post-World War II period, but also British domination in the 19th century and even Iberian colonial control earlier on. In the US case, leverage was especially important when the United States tried to get its way by exerting political leverage, which included military interventions, CIA manipulations, to overthrow or undermine governments considered socialist or communist. And economic leverage, providing or withholding resources to achieve desired ends. For me, the most important example of the use of economic leverage um, was the change in economic model after the 1980s debt crisis from 
state-dominated closed model, ISI, of course, to a private market, more open one, which some people refer to as the Washington Consensus or neoliberalism. Leverage was complemented by linkage in this process, as well as various others. This um, diagram indicates the way I see um, the um, characteristics of dependency in these two periods, the ISI period and the new model period after um, the debt crisis. It shows a couple of things. Again, by my way of looking at things, dependency became more important in the Latin American region as the economies opened up and therefore were more open to international influence. But there were also changes in the characteristics, uh, especially the move from, um, polit from political leverage to more use of economic leverage um, in these two periods. But this is supposed to be about China and Latin America. Um, does the dependency framework travel? Um, that would be our question. Can it be transported from US Latin American relations in the 20th century, which is where it was originated, to China and Latin America in the 21st century? My argument, this is useful for China Latin America, but we must expect changes. Most importantly, to summarize before I go into more detail, China has not used political leverage in Latin America, but has relied on economic leverage to get access to raw materials and markets for its products, and of course, to lobby against relations with Taiwan. Since the recession started in Latin America, um, China has also tried to build linkage type relations to counter increased opposition to its presence. Um, and I also want to emphasize later on in the presentation that there are important differences between the two groups of Latin American countries. Those willing to make deals behind closed doors, which I refer in shorthand to the Venezuela model, and those who insist on more transparent negotiations, um, which I again, for shorthand, um, refer to as the Chile model. So as I mentioned in the um, introductory comments, I find the it's really important to um, look at the timeline for China Latin American relations. Before the early 19, before the, um, the early 2000s, there were very few links. Um, there were diplomatic relations and some minimal trade. An important exception was Cuba. And if anybody wants to come back to that in the Q&A, we can certainly do that. From 2003 to 2013, the so-called China boom, when trade with China stimulated high growth in Latin America and finance from China reinforced the trade boom. But um, from 2014, and I'm dating it here to 2019, recession um, took place, China's imports dropped and Latin America's growth rate fell. Just to finish off this timeline, of course, in 2020, we have the um, COVID-19 um, economic disaster and health disaster in Latin America. The region was very heavily hit. China responded first with what people have called mask diplomacy, um, but also um, what some have called wolf warrior diplomacy. And we can come back to, to these um, as to what those terms might mean. So I want to look first um, at trade within this timeline. Um, this material is familiar to those of you who have followed the um, China Latin American uh, set of relationships, but let me go over it for those who do not. So trade meaning exports and imports reached an initial peak at the end of the boom in 2013. It fell after that, but began to recover in 2016, 2017. The amount of trade in the peak of the boom, 2013, $268 billion, exports plus imports, represented 22 times the amount of trade in the year 2000. But despite this increase, 
trade with China in 2013 accounted for only around 13% of Latin America's total trade. Overall for the region, for the region, come back to this, um, the US continues to dominate trade and Latin America has many other partners as well, including the uh, European Union and regional partners. But China is the main trade partner for four countries, Brazil, Chile, Peru, and Uruguay. And I believe from what I've read in the last couple of weeks that Argentina has now joined that list. Um, it's also the second most important um, trade partner for several other countries. This graph, which uses um, data from ECLAC, shows the um, trade pattern from 2000 up to 2018. Um, these are trade data show a trade in goods, very few services involved in the China Latin American uh, trade relationship until now. Uh, exports the dotted line, imports the dashed line, uh, total trade the um, dark black line and the bars below the trade balance, which in this case is a trade deficit. Um, several takeaways. First, of course, is the rapid increase in trade, um, reaching um, in 2018 about um, $325 billion. Um, also, the short dip in trade in from 2008 to 2009, the global recession, but you can see it didn't last very long. And then the much longer, more important um, fall off in trade, um, 2013 to 2017. Finally, you notice from the bars at the bottom that exports were always lower than imports, creating a large deficit um, from the Latin American region's perspective. From Latin America's perspective, there are several relatively serious problems in trade with China. Um, let me talk about three of them that perhaps reflect dependency relationships. First, Latin America has a huge trade deficit, 60 to $80 billion according to Latin American statistics, which are quite different from the way trade looks based on Chinese statistics. We might wanna come back to why that difference exists. Most of this deficit is due to Mexico. Mexico has very little that China wants to buy, but Mexicans want to buy a lot of stuff from China. So that's the first problem. Second problem, that there is a heavy concentration among countries and products. Somewhere around 80% of Latin American exports to China are from four countries, Brazil, Chile, Peru, and Argentina. And some 70% of Latin American exports are in, concentrated in four products, soy, copper, iron ore, and petroleum. But substantially more important, at least from my perspective, is a third problem. And that is that Latin America mainly exports raw materials to China and buys industrial goods in return. Import. The relying on raw materials as exports have very well known negative consequences, price volatility and thus economic cycles, lack of connections to the rest of the economy, sometimes referred to as an enclave situation, low rates of uh, employment creation. On the other side of the ledger, importing industrial goods causes other kinds of damage undermining the local industries that Latin American countries struggled for decades to create, um, since it's very hard for Latin American firms to compete with their Chinese counterparts, which tend to have subsidies of various sorts. So all in all, even the countries that have allegedly benefited from trade with China often feel that they've gone back to the early 20th century or even before in terms of the characteristics of their relationship with their new um, important trade partner. Finance from China um, eventually came to accompany and reinforce trade relations. The two main kinds of Chinese finance going to Latin America, 
FDI and commercial loans, also a, a small amount of foreign aid to some countries in the region. The largest amount of FDI um, went to the Latin American region as a whole in 2014, right as the boom ended, um, about $20 billion, which was around 8% of Latin America's total FDI. That amount has declined since then in absolute terms, um, although in a very volatile way. The data that I use in the book and that I'm using here are unpublished data from ECLAC, which um, follows investments on a um, project by project basis. The main recipient of FDI from China has been Brazil with Peru and Argentina as um, coming next in the list of, of recipients. Main uh, sectors for FDI are natural resources and energy, but some diversification is actually taking place now into agriculture and finance. The other type of finance loans from Chinese policy banks, um, China Development Bank and China Export Import Bank. Um, these data, of course, are as many of you know very well from the Boston University Inter-American Dialogue database, again, on a project by project, loan by loan basis. Loans have accounted for a slightly larger share of finance than FDI, also very volatile. Um, in this case, the peak was as early as 2010, with $36 billion that year, but has come down um, since then. Loan recipients are quite different than those receiving FDI. Loan recipients are countries that could not access the private capital markets, um, especially Venezuela, but also Ecuador, Bolivia, Nicaragua. Brazil was a possible, ex uh, a partial, I'd say, exception. Um, some points it's had um, wide access to the capital markets and other, and other times it's been more restricted. Loans have mainly gone to finance um, natural resource projects and infrastructure to get those natural resources to um, ports of various sorts and to markets. This graph enables us to do a comparison of FDI and loans and also across the boom period and the follow-up recession period. These are annual averages um, with FDI um, being the dark black um, part of the graph and um, loans being the striped part. Um, again, a couple of interesting takeaways. Um, one obvious and that I want to come back to later because it's quite important is that finance increases as trade drops off. So you can see from the um, boom period to the recession period, may look um, sort of counterintuitive, finance is increasing. Also, we can see, as I said, that loans are slightly larger as an overall share of, between the two periods, but FDI increased more from the first period to the second, from the boom period to the recession. As with trade, there are also um, problems with China's finance to Latin America. Um, one major problem with FDI is that most of the, flow, the flows take the form of mergers and acquisitions. The point is, of course, that mergers and acquisitions are not investment from the point of view of the recipient country, in this case, a Latin American country. It's just a change in ownership. In general, for a recipient country, greenfield, new projects are preferable. For an investor, M&A is usually preferred since the purchaser can get access to a successful ongoing firm. This was true for China as for others. Other problems with FDI, only a few countries have benefited from China's FDI, concentrated in few sectors, very volatile, and it has generally tended to neglect labor and environmental concerns in um, carrying out the FDI projects. Loans 
have gone mainly to countries that are political allies of China. They have been negotiated with very little transparency and have often involved corruption on both sides. Labor and environmental issues are also a concern as far as loans are concerned. Now I wanna spend a few minutes on um, the economic impact of China's relations with Latin America. There's both the positive part and the negative part. Um, 2001 to, two um, okay, I'm getting into my um, table for it. So let me just sort of summarize some of these things um, before I get to the table. Um, it is of course always difficult, if not impossible, to attribute cause and effect kinds of relationships on, uh, in this case, relationships between two countries or a country and a region. But the patterns I believe are very suggestive. And in the book, I quote a couple of studies that try to measure elasticities um, with, in terms of um, growth in China and its impact on growth in Latin America and Latin America's exports. So hard to make a cause and effect argument, but some suggestive kinds of data. So the boom years, 2003-13, based mainly on trade, but also finance, led to high growth, increased investment, more employment, poverty reduction, and perhaps increased inequality. Some have even said that China rescued Latin America from the global financial crisis in 2008, 2009. But all of this went into reverse after the boom ended and China's imports from Latin America fell. Growth rates fell, leading to falling investment rates, increased unemployment and a rise in poverty. This meant that Latin America was already in a very weak position even before COVID struck in 2020. Now here is my table that I um, began to talk about based on World Bank and ECLAC data. And you can see from um, the top of the table, which is a, a background piece, what was going on in the region 2001 to 2003, see that it was a, already a weak period for Latin American economic and social um, conditions, low growth, low investment, low exports, and high unemployment and poverty. And then you can see the very dramatic increase that occurs um, in the boom years. Um, growth picks up with the single exception, of course, of um, the decrease in growth in 2009 from the global re uh, recession. Investment picks up as well. Um, the import pattern is um, a bit more difficult to interpret. We might want to come back to that. We can see that unemployment is falling um, pretty significantly and poverty is falling even more significantly in the region during the years of the China boom. And then you can see um, equally dramatic a change um, after the end of the boom. Um, Latin America falls back to the kind of pattern that we saw um, before the boom, low growth, sometimes negative growth, certainly negative per capita growth, investment falling off. Um, again, exports, uh, we can come back to a bit more complicated that pattern, but unemployment begins to rise again um, and poverty um, begins to rise as well. So a very positive impact during the initial period um, not so much um, during the second period, even before COVID struck. Now here is one of the things that I find most intriguing um, about the recession period in China, and that is the recession period in Latin America, and that is China's political response to that recession. If we look at public opinion polls, we find that views about China among Latin Americans became increasingly negative after the boom ended. Um, the main exception, interestingly, was Mexico, where a positive opinion about China rose as it fell with respect to the United States. So Mexico and uh, 
situation was quite different from the other main countries in the region. Um, to its, improve its image and maintain support for future economic relations with the region, China did not respond with economic threats and leverage as the US would have earlier and like Trump has done recently. Instead, it tried to establish really for the first time linkage types of relationships between China and Latin America. What does this mean? Initially, it meant increased finance and um, keep in mind that the Chinese government has a lot of control over the way um, Chinese finance is exported both through state owned enterprises and state owned policy banks. So there was on the one hand increased finance, but this was um, accompanied by many visits by high level Chinese officials, including five visits by Xi Jinping, um, basically one a year um, since the uh, recession um, began. The issuance of a second white paper on Chinese proposals for expanded relationships with Latin America, more exchanges, including a large number of Latin American stu students studying in China, and joining and building um, regional institutions to connect China and Latin America. So this is what I mean when I say um, there was an attempt to try and um, offset some anger in Latin America by establishing linkage types of relationships as opposed to leverage. This di diagram is um, parallel to the one I showed you earlier about um, the US in Latin America. And it divides the uh, region into these two um, categories I talked about, um, Latin America, what it called here, Latin America one, what I would called earlier the Venezuela model. Um, and then um, the Latin America two category, the Chile model divided into the boom and the um, recession period. Um, different kinds of relationships in the countries that are willing to um, do deals in the back room, markets less important because market prices were not always even used, um, economic leverage, one example being the oil backed loans and linkage, um, not really very important at all. For the other group of countries, markets were more important all along um, because um, deals were done um, based on um, market characteristics. Um, leverage was not used in these cases, um, market substituted and linkage increased as I just talked about, moving from the boom to the recession period. Why the difference between China and the United States in terms of the way they related to perceived problems um, that they might have in the Latin American region? So I've got three hypotheses about why these differences exist. Um, and when I say these differences, basically I'm talking about greater reliance on leverage by the US and linkage by China in the recession period. One is geographical distance. Leverage is simply more difficult to exert at a long distance. Um, also, Latin America is less important for China than China's neighbors in both political and economic terms. So we see a quite different situation in the way China has used leverage with its neighbors compared to how it has not used um, leverage in the Latin American region. Second, lack of knowledge, including language. There is a quote which I've used a number of times, including in the book um, from a well-known um, Chinese economist and policymaker um, some of you will know this person. I've never used his name before in public, but this is Professor Li Xiaoyun from China Agricultural University, who said in a, uh, to me in a, an interview um, a number of years ago, he said, when we go to Southeast Asia, 
we can't speak their language, but we feel comfortable. We feel at home there. We feel that we understand and look at things in the same way. When we go to Africa or Latin America, we're really a bit lost. So that being a bit lost is part of the reason that I um, infer that the response has been of a linkage sort rather than a leverage sort. And then there's always the US presence. Looking over your shoulder all the time, both on the Latin American side and on the Chinese side. Um, what is the US going to think and do um, if we have, we Latin Americans have more um, interaction with China? And of course that has become much more relevant in the Trump years um, when Trump has not hesitated at all to use some really quite extraordinarily um, rough treatment, especially for Mexico and Venezuela. So I think I still have enough time to do my um, last two slides about um, what we might How about expect, it? Go ahead. Sure. What we might expect for the um, near future. Latin America, as um, we all know, and as I showed in that in the table I showed you a few moments ago, has been facing quite serious both economic and social problems since the end of the China boom in 2013. And the United States has been basically ignoring the region, except for, as I just said, these aggressive moves toward Mexico and Venezuela. And some broader pressure with respect to Huawei and 5G um, investments. This scenario um, appears to open opportunities for China. But the interesting question is, does China want to expand relations? There are many impediments on both sides, and it's really not clear um, whether things are going to pick up again or continue at a lower level. If China does want to play a more important role in Latin America, Latin America, or perhaps I should say some Latin Americans, are looking for changes. Um, in particular, there is concern about the emphasis on raw materials in their trade, um, also in their investment relations with China. Latin Americans want what some call a more balanced relationship that basically refers to more industrial uh, exports, but also moving up the value chain. Going back, not being undermined by their trade relationship with China, but being going, not just going back to where they were, but um, moving further up. They also want more transparency and they also want concern for um, and actual um, action to offset labor and environmental problems. Now China says it also wants to construct a new relationship. I actually spent a, um, a semester in China a few years ago um, doing research, interviewing people exactly on this topic. China says, yes, we want a new relationship but it's unclear if they're really doing anything to bring this about. It's unclear what is going to happen. The opportunity for closer relations between China and Latin America is there, but from my perspective, at least, the future is unclear. Um, and maybe we can follow up on this if people have a different view, but let's, let me stop there. Well, thanks so much, Barbara, and thanks everyone for coming. Uh, this is normally where we'd all give a round of applause and opening up for questions. <laughs> but if uh, if a, if the 107 people that are here gave a round of applause, the uh, BU fire marshal would be after our <laughs> offices and we'd all be in trouble. So it's great to be able to do this uh, via webinar. As I just said to, uh, to you folks- know, It's not, uh, really, it's not the, just that, Kevin. It's yeah. really, we wouldn't have 107 people sitting around your conference room. Um, so we've That's actually- sure. It, not just here, but in general, the downside of webinars is obvious, but they, there's an upside too. Yes, well, uh, that's, uh, that's, that's why we're doing this. And I think after, uh, after everyone's back in their offices, I think uh, we'll, be able to, we'll be able to do some more of these uh, anyways. As you can yes, see from the so. questions, hopefully which so. I'm about to read to you, um, folks are asking questions from all over the place. So let me, let me share three or four uh, questions and then let you questions and comments and then I'll let you uh, uh, I'll let you respond to those and then I'll I'll do an I'll do a round 
Okay. So folks, you, if you have questions, put them in the Q&A box. Do a, you want me to stop sharing the... Yeah, why don't you stop sharing the, uh, the list? Okay. And uh, I'll I'll read uh, I'll read some okay. questions. So the first okay. first one I'll read is from Tom Nairns from the University of Albany, and he asks, Has there ever been any attempt by Latin American countries to follow the quote Chile model of transparency and work together to negotiate with China as a bloc uh, instead of bilaterally? Uh, Juliet Liu, who's a postdoctoral fellow at Cornell University, asks. With such differences in China trade relations across Latin American countries, why ground your assessment in a regional approach versus comparing across countries? Could you speak to whether perhaps dependency relations emerge clearly between China and some Latin American countries, but not others? Uh, someone by the name of Stephen Rhee says, I find this presentation xenophobic. Minghao Chu from MIT says, what were some of the key explaining factors for the negative image of China during the China boom? Did the linkage relationships help to improve it? Uh, Greg Chin says, hello, great presentation, Barbara. And the last one for this round I'll, I'll, um, I'll ask is from Grant Road, who's here at Boston University and the Naval War College, who says, although the 16 plus one, 17 plus one grouping in Central and Eastern Europe only formally began in 2012, China's relations with Central and Eastern European countries seem to follow China's Latin American linkage rather than the leverage model. Might this be a broader pattern of China's mode of international behavior? So I'll uh, ask another round after you respond to those. Okay, um, let's start with Tom's question. Um, there really has not been much of an attempt to um, negotiate together with China. Many of us have been suggesting that, pushing them in that direction, um, whether it be on a regional level or um, a sub-regional level. Um, the most promising would seem to be the Pacific Alliance, which was set up from the very beginning um, to work together in terms of relationships with Asia. Um, not necessarily China, but China currently has become the most important. So it hasn't really happened, but I think the, uh, I think, and I'm certainly not alone in this, um, that Latin America would be much better off if at least some groups of countries would try to negotiate together. And with the exception of Brazil, um, individual countries are just not big enough to um, get much leverage with a, um, a bilateral approach. Um, so let's go. Why a regional approach? Um, isn't it the case that China has different kinds of relationships with different countries? Certainly the case, and I tried to, the, my one um, movement in that direction was looking at these two groups of Latin American countries um, in the um, last dependency diagram that I showed. Um, I think that if you have a look at this book, you'll see that I was allowed, this is a very short book, this is a new series by Cambridge and they don't give you much space. Um, I specifically point out in the, at the end of the introduction that we need to go um, down to a, um, a lower level of aggregation, um, but that I think we can get some leverage. I keep using this word, um, which I shouldn't because I'm confusing it with the way I used it in the, in the talk. And um, we can um, get some way to understanding by looking initially at a regional level, but I certainly agree with you that we'd be better off um, to move to a, a lower level of aggregation. Xenophobic, um, I hope not. Uh, let me emphasize something that there's sort of, I would guess, I don't know if you would agree with this or not, Kevin, sort of two schools of thought um, about, um, maybe this is too simplistic about China, Latin American relations. One is that we need to look at um, the China side um, together with the Latin American side. The other, um, I had a debate with Jorge Heine um, last week about this, and that basically it's the Latin American country's fault if they had used, for example, the um, resources they obtained during the boom period to invest more, to do more innovation, that they would um, not be in this situation. Um, so I don't mean to be xenophobic. Um, I think it's the most important thing um, for me is to look at how external and internal relationships interact. 
Um, and we've got some different ways to go back to the previous question that they interact in these two groups of countries. Um, negative during the boom, um, did linkage improve things? Yes, potentially. Um, the Chinese actually are just sort of tiptoeing into um, these linkage kinds of relationships. And this question really fits interestingly with the um, last question about um, Eastern Europe, um, where the, um, the questioner asks, uh, states first that linkage seems to be more important than leverage, and is this a movement in the, in the direction for China? I think it depends a lot on what part of the world we're talking about. Um, the project that I want to do um, after I sort of wind this one down is to look in a comparative way at China's relationships with Latin America compared to China's relationships with South and Southeast Asia. Their leverage is very prominent. Um, so I don't think it's a trend. I think it has to do with different regions and maybe the um, 16 plus one is within a European context and maybe Europe in that sense is playing a similar role to the US presence um, in the Latin American case. But very interesting um, things in terms of um, the way China has related to different um, parts of the world. Um, some of you may, for example, know Reese Jenkins book comparing um, China and with Latin America and Africa, another way of looking at the differences. Okay, shall we go to another group of questions, Kevin? Yes, uh, thanks for those. Uh, thanks for those answers. Um, so, speaking of uh, Riss Jenkins and putting in a plug for his uh, excellent comparative analysis between China in Latin America and China in Africa, uh, he's here with us and has a question. He's from uh, University of East Anglia. And he asks, what is the significance of the Belt and Road Initiative being expanded to Latin America and the Caribbean? And why have the four largest economies not signed uh, MOUs with China on the BRI? Uh, Greg Chin had a, had a second to, to do some thinking and on top of saying a great presentation, uh, Gregory Chin from, from York University in Canada says, um, thinking a bit more about the consequences or implications of the new dependency that you are looking at, my question, is the principal dependency for Latin America still with the US? And if so, could we say that Latin America's relations with China help to reduce or mitigate some of Latin America's dependency on the US? Um, we have a question from James Sunquist, who's a pre-doctoral fellow here at the GDP Center and a PhD student at Yale, studying some of these things. And he says, there's plenty of politics here, but it seems like the roots of what Dr. Stallings is describing are purely economic. One, resource booms and busts. Two, import competition. And three, trouble tapping global financial markets. Do you agree with this summary? If so, what are your recommendations given that the dependency inspired policies like ISI had such a mixed record uh, in, in Latin America? And I'll, I'll, one last one uh, by Alvin Kamba, who is a former uh, GDP Center fellow here uh, and a PhD student in sociology at um, Johns Hopkins University. He asks, I wonder if these dependency relations, linkages, leverage, are more unintended than deliberate in Latin America since Chinese economic planning and firm planning behavior are decentralized. This question resonates as well as your argument that there are more immediate and territorial interests in Southeast Asia than in Latin America. Let you take those. Okay, um, Reese and BRI. I frankly think that the ex so-called extension of the BRI to Latin America is not too important. Um, around the world, it's very hard to figure out sort of what's BRI and what isn't BRI. Um, same kinds of projects are often put under a BRI label. So China's ac investment activities in Latin America pre-BRI um, were quite similar to post-BRI. So I don't, I don't think it's that important. And it's interesting that if you look at um, a number of things from the Asian perspective, they don't even have Latin America in the maps. The maps 
go only to Africa, um, Europe, and Asia. Latin America is not involved from their perspective at all. Um, why have the largest countries not signed? Um, the only um, country that's usually called a, th thought of as a major country that has signed is Chile. Interesting that it's Chile, um, but Mexico hasn't signed. We can imagine why that is. Um, Brazil hasn't signed, um, though they talk about doing it. Uh, maybe they just don't think it's very important. Um, they don't think they're going to get, they don't think they're going to be either penalized for not signing or rewarded for signing. Um, for some of the smaller countries, especially the ones that have recently begun to recognize um, the People's Republic instead of China, that's a different situation. So I don't think it's important for the largest. Um, they'll get what they want from China in any case. Um, Greg always, I was glad that it seemed that he was just going to pass on the first round because he always asks very difficult questions. Um, the principal dependency of Latin America is still with the US and did China's um, entry um, since the, in the last 20 years help to mitigate this? Absolutely. Um, if I have one single word that I um, whisper and yell to any Latin American policymaker that I can um, lay eyes on, it's diversification. The most important thing that um, Latin America can do about its foreign relationships in general is to be as diversified as possible. And China has absolutely helped in this sense. Um, unfortunately, Europe has um, fallen back a bit about the same time that China has come in. So China becomes more important in that sense um, to help counterbalance the United States. Um, among the many, many, many reasons that we're all waiting for the election results in three weeks or four weeks or five weeks or however long it is, um, is that um, the way in which um, the US and Latin America interact may change. I think it may change um, in some significant ways though um, that remains to be seen. But yes, China definitely helped mitigate dependency on the US. Um, James, all economics and no politics. Gee, I hope that's not true. I actually have in the book, um, I have in the, part that's specifically on China and Latin America, I actually have an economics chapter and a politics chapter, which very few people do. And so I thought I was trying to avoid that criticism, but even though I have degrees in both economics and politics, I still am more of an economist than a political scientist. Um, but I, one of the things that are, we could go into some other kinds of political relationships that um, I wasn't talking about today, for example, China's trying to get into the, um, the arms market um, deal. It's running various kinds of um, seminars for military leaders um, in Latin America. There are a number of things that have gone on in addition to um, just regular diplomacy, which is quite important, especially for the largest countries. So we go back and why haven't the largest countries signed BRI? What the largest countries really want is to have um, bilateral uh, relationships with um, Chinese leaders. And Xi Jinping and his um, prime minister and others have been willing to, to follow through. But probably in, not probably, definitely in this talk, um, there was more economics and politics. Um, so in the, in the book, it says not that um, the, the balance is more there. Um, and, Alvin, can you repeat that question, Kevin? I've got, I can't read my, I can't decipher my notes. Linkage and leverage unintended? Sure, sorry, uh, Alvin Kamba asking, uh, um, I wonder if these dependency relationships, relations, linkages and leverage are more unintended than deliberate in Latin America since Chinese economic planning and firm planning behavior are decentralized. Um, I think that that certainly could be said. Um, going back to the BRI, many people think that the BRI is um, equally as um, unintended in the way it uh, plays itself out as um, dependency relationships in the case of Latin America. So a lot of things may be unintended and maybe it's the, to go back to James' question, 
Maybe it's that the politics side is more unintended. Um, certainly the economic side is um, much more intended, I would say, um, though there may be cases that it's merely individual firms trying to get um, access to, um, to good profitable opportunities rather than an, an overall Chinese government um, kind of policy. So that's another kind of debate um, that doesn't pertain just to Latin America, but to China and um, certainly the developing world, maybe China and the world. Our economic relations um, basically ones of um, profit and loss, or are they part of an overall um, Chinese schema to get a more and more important role on the world stage? Um, so yes, I think that certainly the political relationships may be a bit more unintended. Um, I would have to do some interviews to um, find out to what extent on the Chinese side, they would agree with me that what they were trying to do, that they, one, they recognized that um, public opinion was turning against China after the boom ended, and two were the things that I mentioned seen by them as um, actual intended ways of dealing with this fall in um, public opinion. So I'll, I'll take an incomplete on that, um, on that answer. Okay, uh, we've really lit up with a, a number of uh, a number of questions now. Uh, we have one from a BU student, Maria Santarelli. She says she's really interested in the development of Venezuela. And today, my question for you is this: Can you talk a little bit more about the Venezuelan model? Venezuela is an extremely vulnerable country that is struggling to pay its loans back to China. In light of this. How does the Chinese, quote, mask diplomacy unfold in Venezuela? Is the relationship with Venezuela uh, as mutual bene eh, really benef beneficial to China? We have a question from Julia Strauss from SOAS. And she says, isn't there a slight problem with treating China as a unitary actor here? Of course, we all need to use these shorthands by assuming rationality and a unitary actor might be a bit problematic. So you could have Chinese firms that fundamentally want and need to make money and do so quickly, uh, given the incentives and the readiness to ignore the local environmental labor rules. Uh, it's hardly confined to Chinese firms. Um, let's see. We have um, Gilberto Libiano, professor from the Federal University of Minas Gerais in Brazil. He says, your data clearly shows the differences between the China boom years and the recession years. However, after 2014, there's been an important change in many countries across Latin America regarding the rise of right-wing governments, in general backed up by the US. How do you think the external China-related and internal factors interact in explaining this post-2014 decline? Uh, maybe one, maybe one more. Is that is that? Um, Just one more. Okay. Um, we have Victoria Chone, um, a student of um, of Carol Wise's at the University of Southern California and a uh, pre-doctoral fellow here at the GDP Center. She says, um, "Could you elaborate?" on the trend that you showed regarding Chinese finance increasing as, a, as trade decreased. What would that mean for Sino-Latin American relations? Is that a shift in how China may be approaching Latin American countries with which it's not having much bilateral trade? Or is that an increase in finance related to say the BRI? Okay, um, let's go back to Maria and the Venezuela model. Um, Venezuela initially uh, it seemed like there was a complementary relationship, um, at least on the economic level, between um, Venezuela under Chavez and um, China. So China wanted oil, Venezuela wanted to sell its oil to somebody other than just the United States. Um, what even then um, China was not very enthusiastic about, um, Chavez wanted more than just to sell its oil. It wanted to um, drag uh, China into its fights and conflicts with the United States. And China was not interested in that, but it was interested in the oil relationship. 
but two things I would say, there are many, many, many things, of course, one could say about um, the situation in, in Venezuela. One is that the Chinese were smarter, maybe, than um, US lenders. According to the data that I'm familiar with, um, both the US via the bond markets and China via the, mainly via the policy banks, lent Venezuela about $60 billion. If you look at the situation today, Venezuela still owes $60 billion to the US. It owes $20 billion to China because of the ongoing um, payment via um, oil and oil revenues. So China was more intelligent in the way it dealt with Venezuela. Nonetheless, um, Venezuela has proved to be an example of how if you owe a lot of money, if you owe just a little money, then the lender is the um, powerful one. If you owe a lot of money, then the um, borrower ends up becoming most important. So uh, Venezuela has been, I think this is a good example of this lack of knowledge, lack of understanding, um, far away, not knowing how to deal with um, the Venezuelan situation. Um, Venezuela, China clearly is very concerned to get back those $20 billion and whatever else they may have um, involved. They certainly don't want their own population to hear that um, they have lost all this money in this place very far away. And so they're sort of in between a rock and a hard place. Um, and they've been playing, they've been taking a very low profile. If you look at, compare Russia and China and Venezuela, it's interesting that Russia has been quite aggressive in defending Venezuela and China is sort of um, in the background. It's given a bit of money to try and get the oil um, flowing again, but it's also been, um, doing various kinds of contacts with um, the Guaido people. Um, I think China would be quite happy to have Juan Guaido as long as um, it was guaranteed that they would get their money back and that they would have access to um, oil as far as they wanted. Mass diplomacy um, has been, I think it's been important across the region. Um, for China, it may be, uh, for Venezuela, it may be more important than some other countries because uh, Venezuela doesn't really have uh, many other possible partners. Um, so the last part of that is that it is Venezuela a benefit to um, China at the moment? Um, no, but it has been and was certainly perceived to be in the past. Julia, China is a unitary actor. I completely agree. Um, thank you for, even though I can't do anything about it right now, I agree with you and I thank you for that question to put it on the table because we should certainly be thinking along those lines. There are lots of um, different important actors, um, some of which I mention in the book, but I don't really go down and um, sort of parse out what are the most important actors and how may they have the same interests or different interests or conflicting interests as far as Latin America is concerned. So we could think at a minimum about um, state-owned enterprises that are investing. We could think about smaller firms that may want to do trade or investment deals. Um, we can think about um, people who want to sell arms. We can think about, um, interestingly, not just um, the national government, but different parts of the national government and provincial governments. Provincial governments have been very important, more so perhaps in Southeast Asia than in Latin America because of the proximity and the greater ease of, for smaller firms to do business closer to home. But there are lots and lots of um, important, the policy banks, of course, very important. Um, are they being forced to um, finance some of these projects? Um, which are a benefit to state-owned enterprises. Lots of things that one could look at in a more detailed level. I can't um, say anything more about that because I accept your criticism that I, I and others need to think more about China as a, um, a non-unitary actor. Um, Gilberto. Um, okay, so this goes back to, we need to have more politics in the story. You're saying that um, boom and, and recession 
um, are clear, but there have been other things that have happened um, in the post-boom years as well. Um, certainly um, some right-wing governments or left-wing governments, um, populist governments coming into power in that period. Um, so how is that, um, how is that related to China? In some, in some funny ways, actually. Um, let's look at Bolsonaro versus Pineda in this period. Um, Bolsonaro, as you certainly know, coming from Brazil and others, some of you certainly, some of you know, um, Bolsonaro, when he was campaigning for the Brazilian presidency, campaigned very much against China. Um, his statement was that China was not buying in Brazil, China was buying Brazil. But then after he became president, um, he began to back off a bit. And um, since China is his main trade partner and one of his main um, sources of investment, um, he became more pragmatic about that. Nonetheless, there were some, were and are some um, complicated, wouldn't say hostile, but not always friendly relationships between Brazil and China under Bolsonaro, this new um, right-wing populist government in that country. Chile, Pineda, I already mentioned that Chile is the only major country um, who signed an agreement um, for the BRI. Um, and Pineda was, um, I believe, um, the only Latin American president that went to um, the BRI forum in Beijing. Um, doing lots of business now, some of it, um, we could talk about whether it's an advantage or disadvantage to Chile, especially the lithium um, investments that China has made, um, the underwater cable, um, which has had some US dependency kinds of relationships interfering with the way that cable was supposed to be. Um, but yes, this would be another way of trying to bring in um, some um, politics into the story. We need to look at some of those governments and how they behaved. And then finally, Victoria. Um, the trend of finance increasing as trade decreases, is this a shift? Does this represent a shift in types of relationships um, that might last into the future? Um, I'm not too sure because if we look um, from the period, let's say 2017, 18, 19, we don't know what's going on right now. That may completely upend anything that we might be able to say. But 17, 18, 19, trade goes back up as finance goes back up. So it's, it's really not clear if this is a shift in type of relationships or if um, the trade and finance relationships are becoming more intertwined or what's going on. I think that's a good question to try and think about in future research. And I'm going to put a mark on it, my um, piece of paper here to think about that a bit more. Um, what do these trends say about the way, if there are, if there continue to be important relationships between China and some parts of Latin America, then how are those relationships going to play out in terms of the two types of economic relations I talked about, as well as the political relationships that several of the um, commentators have, have mentioned. Okay, ready, Kevin. Thanks so much, Barbara. Uh, well, let's just do uh, one one last cluster of questions, um, and then uh, any final remarks you you want to share with folks. Um, I have one from Gabrielle Garcia from the University of Wollongong in Australia. She said, uh, Gabrielle says, uh, Latin America is a very diverse region. A few South American countries, such as Brazil, Chile, and per Peru and Uruguay, have trade surpluses, not deficits. Do you think it is viable that they would come together to renegotiate them as a block? And what do you think about SELAC as a platform uh, for, for such block negotiation? We have Fan Wenhao from Shanghai. Uh, and Fan Wenhao asks, what mistakes have Chinese companies made in Latin America? 
Any chance Chinese companies cooperate or strengthen cooperation with Western companies in joint business ventures? <laughs> Question mark. Um, then we have uh, Poliana Portela, an MA candidate at the Federal University of Paraiba in Brazil. And Poliana asks, what are the risks of commodity-backed loans to Latin America by Chinese policy banks in a time of post-COVID recessions? And the last one uh, is from Jerry Harris uh, from the National Secretary of Global Studies Association. Uh, Jerry notes that a RAND paper reports that Chinese transnational corporations seek low-wage advantages, as do all transnational corporations. But unlike most global firms who turn quickly to layoffs during market volatility, Chinese firms uh, were found to be committed to labor stability, spend more time on training at both the labor and managerial level, and are more embedded in the local economy and more concessionary with unions. Have you considered such elements in your evaluation of Chinese labor relations? Um, let's see, can I sneak one, one more in there? Um, uh, given that a lot of companies that are invested in Latin America are state-owned enterprises, do you think the government has more incentives to discipline these companies in terms of social environmental responsibilities? I think uh, that question is, do you think the Chinese government uh, can- That was what I was going to ask. Which government are you talking about? <laughs> I, I think that, um, uh, I think that that's what we're, uh, that's what we mean here. Okay, well, uh, why don't you take that last cluster and um, and have any have any closing remarks? Okay, Gower Dan. Um, yes, this goes back to um, we shouldn't really be talking about Latin America as a region because there are really different um, countries in this region, and one of the important ways in which they do differ are what they export, does China want that? And China wants what the um, South American commodity exporters have, and therefore buys a lot of stuff from them, um, resulting in, sometimes they have surpluses, and sometimes they have deficits, but they're basically relatively balanced trade. Unlike Central America and Mexico, which have very unbalanced trade. So I think it derives from the kind of exports and the way those exports fit into um, what China is looking for in its trade relationships. So again, I, the implicit um, idea here, I think is one that some of your fellow um, discussants have, have brought up, the need to um, look below the regional level um, at least into terms of certain categories of, of countries. So I take that as a, um, an implicit idea for future research. CELAC, I think CELAC is not a useful organization at all. CELAC never was important. China, this is an example of China taking the lead on lots of the things having to do with China-Latin America relations. So in general, Latin America needs to step up to the plate, decide what they want to do, either individually or, um, or as a group. I think some of the uh, regional integration organizations are um, more important. I mentioned the Pacific Alliance, which I have a particular fondness for and hope for, but it keeps um, sort of disappointing me. But I think CELAC is not going to be um, the one that's going to help um, Latin America China relationships to improve in the sense of um, moving up the value chain or uh, having more industrial exports. Um, Fun, a very interesting question. What mistakes have Chinese companies made? Um, I don't know. I don't know if you had this in here, um, but I'm going to add it in. In any case, even if you didn't, I was writing real fast. Um, what have Chinese companies learned? Um, and could they cooperate with US firms? Um, Chinese firms, when they first came to Latin America, knew nothing at all about the region. Um, and so they made lots of mistakes. Um, Jumping down to the labor question, um, it's a bit down on the list, 
They made a lot of mistakes in terms of how they dealt with labor. Um, one of the early, very interesting books by um, Cindy Sanborn and some of her colleagues about labor relations in Peru um, with Chinese firms um, may have opened some eyes in China. Um, so coming in basically and trying to um, just do things the old way that they had always done. There are, uh, and I would be interested in um, Reese's opinion about this, but I don't think we have time right now. Some people in Latin America think that China was trying, at least initially, to transfer the model of how they interacted um, China with Africa to China and Latin America. And Latin Americans say, oh, that's not what we're about. We are much more sophisticated. Um, we have um, both more sophisticated productive structures, also better trained, more sophisticated labor, et cetera. Um, so bit by bit, and then China also had no experience to speak of um, with um, the system that the Chile model has followed in terms of um, insisting on um, Chinese companies taking part in bidding um, processes for government procurement, various kinds of joint uh, PPP projects, um, etc. But bit by bit, they seem to have been um, learning more about how Latin America does things. I think um, I haven't really investigated this very much myself, but I have read some things, including people from the BU um, research cluster, that insofar as, in this case, Latin American countries, but it would hold for any recipient countries. Insofar as Latin American countries put down rules, whether it be about the environment or about labor or about um, technology or whatever else, insofar as rules are established, the Chinese seem to be increasingly willing to go along with some of those as long as they can still um, get access to, to projects. Could they cooperate with US firms? You know, I, I was involved in a, um, I guess they called it a conference um, that was organized by Jiang Shishui um, last week out of um, Shanghai University. And I was suggesting to everyone's um, lack of agreement that perhaps, um, the US and China at a, a government level as opposed to a firm level might be able to cooperate some more under a Biden presidency. Um, but cooperation between firms is generally difficult in any case because everyone's afraid of um, other firms getting access to their um, privileged um, technology or intellectual property or whatever it might be. Um, so I'm not sure about cooperating with U.S. firms. They might be able to learn some lessons, negative and positive from U.S. firms, looking at how U.S. firms um, have succeeded or not um, over the long term in Latin America. But some things to think about there. Poliana, um, risks of oil-backed loans. Um, well, hey, Venezuela is a good example of that. Um, that at the moment, uh, Venezuela is in quite a mess with its oil back loans. But on the other hand, as I said, Venezuela has gotten back two thirds of the money it lent to China, to Venezuela, because it used the oil back loans. So oil back loans can be useful if properly um, managed um, by the Chinese side. We saw in the Ecuador case, one of my students at the program I teach at in China, um, did her thesis a couple of years ago on um, China and Ecuador. And Ecuador got into not as big a mess as Venezuela is right now, but it had the vast majority of its oil revenues um, owed to China in order to service its loans. And in addition, got into trouble with um, low quality of some of the Chinese investments in, in Ecuador. So um, Ecuador and Venezuela both have lessons to teach perhaps in terms of the oil back loans. Um, Ecuador has now 
to the great surprise of its former president, Correa, because he thought the person, um, Lenin Moreno, who was going to replace him was a, an acolyte, but it turned out that Moreno went in the opposite direction. And so China now has very little um, access to Ecuador and Ecuador's resources of various kinds because um, uh, Venezuela, excuse me, Ecuador has decided to deal with the US and the IMF rather than with China. So that is an example of a negative side of oil-backed loans. Um, Jerry, the RAND report on um, all firms, Chinese firms, other firms want low wage advantages. Actually, that's not necessarily true. Um, one of the useful things that the UN um, Commission on Transnational Corporations or whatever it's called, if it still exists even, um, has done and um, some of the ECLAC and some of the other UN organizations have followed up on. So there are a variety of different reasons um, that a multinational corporation will go to a given country. Low wage, certainly one of them, but it's not the only one. Um, but this whole issue of have I taken into account that um, the Chinese, perhaps this is a result of learning, um, going back to the question earlier on, um, that they have been um, treating Chinese, uh, treating local labor better. They're more concerned about labor stability, about training for the long term. So does this give um, the Chinese side a more positive spin than the characteristics that I've talked about? Um, possibly. I would toss in here a plug for a book by um, a friend of mine, which is coming out, um, I think, the beginning of next year on so-called patient capital, another way in which um, the China long-term point of view, um, not just labor stability, but also in fiscal terms, um, may be an advantage that um, I'm not taking into account sufficiently um, in this analysis. Um, a bit more in the book, but um, not so much here today when you have to try to figure out how to um, scale things down for 40 minutes. Um, and then the um, final question, um, state-owned enterprises being extremely important, one of the pieces of the um, China unitary actor that we talked about a moment ago. Um, does China have more of an incentive to try and discipline the firms since they are um, state-owned firms? Um, one might think so, but I'm not even, I find it quite difficult to figure out the difference between state-owned firms and so-called private firms in China, um, especially what the direction that Xi Jinping is going in um, right now, um, getting more control, making sure that there are party um, officials in each of the private firms. So I think that that distinction is, has never been completely clear to me at least, and may be coming um, less important. So we could broaden that. Does, does Ch the Chinese government have an incentive to um, discipline all of its firms so that they behave um, appropriately um, abroad and um, produce um, a add to China's good image rather than um, casting doubt on China's image? Um, perhaps, but this may get back to the question, let me see if I can find the unintended, um, Alvin's question about the unintended way in which um, Chinese firms and the Chinese government go about things. I think that perhaps we, myself included, um, give too much credit to China in terms of um, their ab ability and maybe even um, intention to have a um, well thought out plan um, and to um, have this idea of here is what we want to do in the next um, 25, 50 years um, and how do we Latin American, for Latin American um, investments um, by SOEs or private firms fit into that. So maybe we give them a bit too much credit. Um, Certainly, China is more interested in disciplining the way firms operate at home 
um, than um, they are abroad and they have more ability to discipline firms and other actors at home um, than they do abroad. Um, so that I guess is what I have to say about this set of questions. Well, thanks so much, Barbara. It's been great to have you here. Uh, over a hundred people, uh, uh, many of them stayed through the whole thing and um, encourage all you folks to uh, go out there and, and uh, take a deeper look at the book. It's called Dependency in the 21st Century Question Mark, Political Economy of China-Latin America Relations from Cambridge University Press. It's been great to uh, have this conversation and hear these insights from Barbara Stallings. And thanks uh, all, of you, all to all of you folks, uh, students, experts, people from all over the world asking questions. Uh, we invite you to come back next Wednesday at 9 a.m. EDT. Uh, members of the BU, uh, BU team will be uh, discussing a new spatial data set of Chinese overseas uh, policy bank loans and its implications for biodiversity. Tomorrow morning, you could join me in a conversation with Joseph Stiglitz about the International Monetary Fund's uh, response to the COVID-19 economic crisis. Uh, you need to go to the webpage and register for that one tomorrow. Um, and just please uh, take a look at our webpage, www.bu.edu slash GDP to find out about events like these uh, throughout the semester and over the course of the year and, uh, and some of our materials. I should note that one of the things that we put out each year is something called the China Latin America Economic Bulletin, yes. which tries to uh, compile some of the, the key data as uh, Professor Stallings noted. Uh, some of this stuff is difficult to, to get into one place, and we try to do a, a quick assessment uh, each year and an update on on what, uh, just by the numbers, what the China-Latin American economic relationship is. So you can Let me put a plug like in that. for that um, document. That's one of the uh, first things that I read when it comes out. But Kevin, I also right. want to take just a minute to thank um, 18 people for answer, asking really interesting questions, and they've given me a lot more um, to think about, and so that's that's what I managed to get out of this event. Um, so thank you very much for your um, comments and let's call them suggestions. I hope to be able to follow up on some of them and to see you at some of the other um, Wednesday morning events um, later in the semester. Thanks, Barbara. Thanks everybody.